Amen, amen. You guys can have a seat. So good to be in church with you this morning. Um, I want to I wanna just, before we get into to other things this morning, I want to take just a second on behalf of Polly. Thank you so much, Abby. Um, on behalf of Polly and myself, uh, to thank you for last weekend. Um, you, you guys um, planned just a, a, an incredibly special day um, in our honor, and I just thank you for that. Um, thank you for the way that you have always um, loved and supported Polly and I, our family, uh, our children. Thank you for the way you've just loved our whole family. You have become uh, family to our children because you've treated them like your own, and you treat every child and every family member uh, that's a part of this place that way. And so I just thank you for that, and thank you for all the kind uh, ways that you, you just blessed us last week. Um, I say this often, it's just the greatest honor of our lives to be your pastor and to, um, to get to do life with you and to, to watch over you, um, because we indeed do that. We pray for you. Um, man, when we hear something good that's happening uh, for you or in you or in your family, um, man, we, it just excites us. We get, we get so excited and amped up about that. And when, and when you grieve, when something uh, has happened in your life, it hurts. We feel that, and we pray for you. We love you very much. I don't know how to say it any more than that. We just love you, and we're blessed to be your pastors. Uh, so, so I want to thank you for that. Um, one of the ways that, um, uh, that I'm, I'm super thankful for you guys is your heart for people and your heart to, to reach people with the gospel. Um, as you know, we've been a part of planting, um, helping to, to, to start and plant uh, a number of churches over the years. This church, our church itself, was at one time a church plant. Um, and so it's in the DNA of this house, and we have tried to, to invest in, pour into, plant seeds, sow into other church plants and startups over the years. And, um, and we have just uh, endeavored to do that once again. Um, as, you, as you know, last September, uh, our church played a significant role in planting Way Church in Nashville, Tennessee through Noah and Maddie, um, our son and, and daughter-in-law, um, which, by the way, um, man, we're so, it, we're so excited this morning, si- excited and scared to death because uh, both of our grandbabies are being dropped off to us tonight for an entire week. Um, so, uh, so we are excited and scared to death of how tired we're going to be at the end of this week. Um, but, but, but you can pray for us um, in that way. Um, but, but we are so, so, so excited this morning to introduce you to someone. Um, I'm going to go ahead and ask uh, Pastor Joshua and Mo, if you guys would join me on the stage. I want to introduce you to a very, very special uh, couple this morning. And uh, uh, you can bring the whole, the whole family if you want. Who, um, I'm not sure who all is with you today, but um, would you guys help me welcome uh, Pastor Joshua and Mo to, to the stage? <laughs> Love you guys, Pastor Mo. Um, so you guys get to experience firsthand what it's like to look out here and see nothing because of these lights, right? Um, uh, Pastor Joshua and, and his lovely wife, Mo, um, are planting a church right here in our community. They have been meeting for uh, many months in their home uh, on Sunday afternoons. Many of you may have already met them because they've been attending here on Sunday mornings for, for several months and, and then on Sunday afternoons, they have church in their house, in their neighborhood, uh, with four, five, six families um, that they have reached, Vietnamese-speaking families um, that they have reached with the gospel um, and are beginning to, to disciple and minister to them. Uh, Pastor Joshua um, came to us months ago, and he began to share his heart uh, with me and with our church board uh, to reach the Vietnamese community in our area. There's a very large uh, Vietnamese community in the, in the Atlanta area, 
And they specifically feel called to reach those uh, in that community, specifically those who, who are unchurched, who do not know Jesus. Many of them have never even heard the name. Uh, and the majority of the people they are reaching only speak Vietnamese. Um, now, for most of you, that's a challenge. Uh, for me, I speak fluent Vietnamese, so it's not an issue. No, I'm just kidding. What that means is most of us would never have an opportunity to reach this community of, of people. Um, and so we began to meet and talk and get to know uh, Pastor Joshua and his wife and uh, have, just, have just fallen in love with their heart uh, to reach people with the message of Jesus. And so they ha have had a need of, of a place to meet uh, so that they can grow. Um, the neighbors love that they're reaching people for Jesus, but cars parked on the street and next door, you know, you know how they can get to be in a subdivision. And so they've been looking for a place that would be willing to open their doors to them so that they can reach people for Jesus in the Vietnamese community. And so our church board staff, our leadership here at the church have prayed about this for months. We have prayed with Pastor Joshua and um, have made the decision to open up our doors at Neighborhood Church to allow them to come in and start their church. Um, so... So they actually had their first uh, meeting, their first service here in our building last Sunday. Um, and so, but you guys had a very special day planned last Sunday that I uh, was kept in the dark all about, so didn't know what that would look like. So we waited till today to introduce them to you. Um, so every Sunday, they will be meeting here. They're meeting back here in our youth room for now, um, and they are... Uh, we'll be meeting at, at from, from 1 o'clock till around 4.30 every Sunday for their church service. And uh, we're just thankful. We're, we're, um, we feel that we are blessed uh, to open up our doors to you. Um, and we just pray and believe that God is going to bless you. He's going to use you uh, in this community and beyond to reach people that, that we might not ever have an opportunity to reach, but we're going to partner with you in that. Um, we're all on the same team, right? Team Jesus. And, uh, and uh, so, so I want you, Neighborhood Church, to join me this morning, and I want us to pray a prayer of, of blessing over Pastor Joshua and Mo. Uh, would you mind to stand with me just one more time this morning? And um, if I could get uh, a microphone, Abby, thank you. Um, Pastor, would you like to say anything at all this morning? You can't preach, but... <laughs> uh, just uh, want to say thank you, Pastor Tori uh, Heron and Pastor Polly. Uh, thank you for your kind heart to uh, really listen to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, to uh, open up the uh, place for us to meet, uh, all for the Lord Jesus. Uh, I come to know the Lord, and I know that without Jesus, when we pass through this life, we will be in a place very, very hard. And death eternally, uh, separation with, uh, with our Father. And our desire to reach out to the people and to bring the gospel, what Christ had made so clear and so loved to the world that he shed his blood. And only through his blood, we are able to reconnect with our Father yes. and to be blessed to have eternal life. And Jesus is the only way, and uh, he's make it so easy so easy, but people need to know the Lord. Yes. And that's our heart to uh, want to reach out to the uh, Vietnamese people. Not only that, but uh, how many Asian in the church here? We don't see that much. And uh, it's the same thing with other big mega churches. Uh, we, we do have some, some of them, but on, you know, you can count them on the palm of your hand. Uh, I don't know why, but we have a mission. 
we have a mission to reach out to the uh, Vietnamese as well as uh, other communities, uh, especially Asian, uh, and, and that's our heart. So thank you so much, uh, Pastor, uh, and the congregation here, the leader team, uh, to open up the place, and we're expecting uh, a great uh, uh, time from the Lord uh, because of his love, because he will move uh, heaven, he will move mountain, he will move everything yes, yes. so that people can uh, come to know the Lord. Amen. And he had already did everything that he could to uh, reconcile the world to him. And he will do it again in the church and every church that desire to uh, see his kingdom come. Amen. May Amen. the Lord bless you all. Amen. Amen. Thank you. If you guys would um, join me in prayer, just stretch your hand this way if, you, if you're comfortable in, in agreement as we just pray for Pastor Joshua and Mo. Father, we love you so much today. Lord God, I thank you for this, this man and woman of God, God, that you have called. Father, you've placed a mantle on their shoulders that without you, without your Holy Spirit, will be too heavy to bear. But Father, we thank you that they are full of your Spirit, that you are leading and guiding them, and Father, we pray that you would, in the days and weeks and months and years to come, continue to order their steps. Lord, that you would continue to make provision for them. Father, that you would protect them. God, that you would give them your peace. And God, I pray that you would just open doors for them and make a way for them in places and ways that, that no man ever could. Father, we pray for a great harvest that they will see, Lord, as they work and as they sow and as they endeavor, Lord. I pray that you would send forth the laborers. God, the harvest is plentiful, you said in your word, but the laborers are few. And we do as your word said today, and we ask that you would send forth the laborers. God, we just pray in Jesus' name, Lord, that God, as they seek to to share you with others, Lord, that you would go before them and go ahead of them, Lord, that you would soften hearts and you would, you would open up minds, Lord. God, that you would give them connections in the community and favor in the community, favor with, in, in places of business, in neighborhoods, in, in various places, Lord. Give them your favor. Just go ahead of them, Lord, and pave the way, Lord. God, we thank you for what's going to come of this great church. We thank you for this man and woman and their family, and we just pray your mighty, mighty blessings over them today. May they be blessed in their coming, in their going, in all of their efforts today, Lord, and we give you all the praise. We give you all the glory for the things that are to come, and we just pray that you would use Neighborhood Church to be a blessing to their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Pastor Joshua and Mo, listen, when you're in this house... When you're in this house, like, like in, when we have a guest in any of our homes, you're family. So welcome to the family. We love you guys. Thank you, guys. You may be seated. Thank you. Super, super excited. So you may not remember, but a couple Sundays back, um, began to preach from the book of Ruth and... I don't know if I've ever preached through the entire book of Ruth, um, but I want to continue uh, to preach from that book today. Um, the book of Ruth is, is an incredible uh, kind of a love story, and we kind of tiptoed into that last week and told how that whole story got, got started. Um, there's so much to learn from the book of Ruth. Um, it's an incredible story of, of repentance and redemption. It's a, it's a story of the supernatural providence of God. Uh, it's, it's a love story. And today, um, we're just going to kind of dive a little bit more into this whole love story, into the beginning stages of this, this love story that would be a love story that would go on to, to change 
the course of history uh, like no other love story. And we'll get into that today and in the, and in the coming weeks. But this morning in the passage, we learn a lot about marriage in particular. We learn a lot about marriage. We learn a lot about uh, relationships. And we learn some of the most foundational principles about just being a follower of Christ and, and being in the household of faith that you, you can learn from any other book of the Bible. We're going to learn right here from, from this morning. But I want to ask you this morning, since we're talking about uh, the, the, the content that we'll be talking about, how many of you this morning, um, you hope to have a good marriage? Would you raise your hand? If you're already married today, it may, you, you hope to have a great marriage. Or, or maybe if you're not married yet, you, you, you maybe probably hope to one day have a good marriage. And so as we get into this story this morning, I want to ask you to think about, you know, how does that happen? How does that happen in today's culture? Um, you know, you, you want to meet someone, you want to date someone, eventually marry someone and have a marriage and a relationship that is going to uh, honor God and, and be a blessing to you and to your, to your spouse. H how does that even happen in today's very challenging, in a lot of ways, culture? How, do, how does it even happen? I mean, do you just, do you roll up into house group and, and, and just kind of be like, hey, is it, is it hot in here or is that just the Holy Ghost burning inside of you? You know, how, how do you meet people today? Do you, do you roll up into house group and you just say, you know, you, you got, girl, you got to be a Bible verse because I just want to memorize you. I, I got more. Um, I, got, I got more. Uh, is, is your name Faith? Because, girl, you are certainly everything I've ever hoped for. I'll stop. How does it even happen? Thank you for that courteous applause. How does it even happen today? How do you, how do you meet the kind of person you want to meet that you want to have a relationship with? How do you have that relationship? What do you do? How does it even happen today? How, how do you go on to have a, a, a wonderful, God-honoring, blessed, uh, happy marriage? How does this even happen? Um, and what makes it even more complicated than ever before, I want you to listen to these next few statistics I want to give you. For the first time in our lifetime, the majority of adults are not married. For the first time in our lifetime, the majority of adults living in America today are not married. They are, are single. Recent studies tell us this, that over the last 50 years, marriage rates in the United States have dropped by nearly 60%. 63% of men under the age of 30 are choosing today to be single, to stay single. They would rather be single than to be married, according to recent studies. 77% of millennials prefer to live with their partner before getting married. It's the old, you know, um, I, I don't want to buy a car without test driving it first. It's the, you know, um, it's just a, a hassle. Some of the things, some of the statements in the studies done that were made by, by single people today are, I just enjoy my freedom too much. You know, why buy the cow when you get the milk for free? Well, can I just remind us all this morning that, that marriage is, is so much more than it can't even be equated in any way, in the slightest bit, to the purchase of a car, to the purchase of a house. Women are not cows. Um, by the way, marriage is a very holy, sacred institution and covenant before a very holy and sacred God. So how do we do it today? It seems that people are delaying or even avoiding marriage today, but people still confess that they, they want to meet someone special. And so many people go ahead and get in a relationship today, maybe even take that next step of marriage, and the statistics tell us that more than half 
of those marriages today are marriages in the United States end in divorce, and the other half just seem to struggle. So, so something's not working, right? Something is not working, yet most people keep doing what others are doing. Most people keep doing what most people are doing. So if you do what most people do, you know what you get? What most people get. If you do what just everybody is doing, you get what just everybody is getting, which when it comes to relationship and marriage, it's breakups, it's heartache, it's you go your way, I go my way, it's divorce, it's all of these things. So I want to talk about a different approach this morning that we learned from the book of Ruth. I want to talk about living within the supernatural providence of God. Living within the supernatural providence of God. So a quick review of where we started in the book of Ruth. Um, The book of Ruth is a story of an ordinary family who lived in Bethlehem, and uh, there was a famine in the city of Bethlehem, in the town of Bethlehem. And so this ordinary family moves in in an effort to to find a better life, to to sort of get an upgrade in life. There's a famine in Bethlehem. The father decides, I'm going to take my family and we're going to move to Moab because things have got to be better there than they are here in this land where there's a famine going on right now. So he takes his family, they move to Moab. The problem with that was, remember, Moab was a place that God had forbidden his people to go and to live because it was such a sinful place. God called it his wash basin. He said, this is literally where I, where I wash my feet. This place is so uh, so hideous. They worship the false god of Chemosh, a god that, that requires the sacrifice of children. It, they worship false idols, this false god. Um, it was a horrid, horrid place. And so this father takes his family thinking things have got to be better over there, and they move to Moab in an effort to save their family, get a, a better life. And what happens, do you remember? That father and both of his sons end up dying. Both of them die. So chapter one of Ruth starts kind of with heartbreak and loss. His wife, the dad, the father's wife, Naomi, um, she returns, ends up returning back to Bethlehem, leaves Moab, returns to Bethlehem. But while they were in Moab, their two sons had married Moab women. Remember the story? They had married Moabite women, uh, Ruth and Orpah. One of them decided to stay in Moab, but the other daughter, daughter daughter-in-law, Ruth, decided to go back to Bethlehem with Naomi. And this is where we get this, this kind of famous scripture where Ruth said these words. She said to her mother in law, Naomi, where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. So Naomi and Ruth return to Bethlehem, homeless, helpless, and hurting. So chapter 1 comes to an end, and then we turn the page. Chapter 1 comes to an end, and then we turn the page, and today we're in a brand new chapter. Chapter 1 is behind us. We're now in chapter 2. And I don't know who this is for this morning, but somebody this morning, God wants you to, to turn the page. Somebody this morning, God wants you to know that there's more chapters to your story. That you may have been in chapter 1 for a long time, or you might be in chapter 1, and chapter 1 is not a good chapter for you right now. God wants some of you to know this morning that there's more chapters. Turn the page We're now in chapter 2. What you'll discover when you turn away from Moab is that you find the blessings of God in Bethlehem. So in chapter 2, verse 1, is where we're going to pick it up this morning. It says this. It says, now Naomi, this is the mom whose dad, I'm sorry, her husband and both her sons died in Moab. She's now gone back to Bethlehem. Now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side. He was a man of standing, the Bible says, from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. Everybody say Boaz. Boaz. The Bible says that he was a man of standing. 
And I love that description of Boaz. Boaz doesn't describe him as, he, Boaz was a strong man. He was a, a, a tall, dark, and handsome man. He was a, a man that had nice arms. He, but the Bible says he was a man of standing. He was a man of standing. And what that literally meant in the Hebrew, the Hebrew words that that phrase man of standing came from literally taught, spoke of his wealth, meaning he was a man of means, he was a man that probably owned property, but it particularly meant that it referred to an internal strength of his integrity and his character and his internal strength. He was a, a man of, of standing. Now listen, ladies, if you're looking for a man, if you're hoping one day to find that kind of man, a man of standing, you want to find a Boaz. This is the guy you want to find. Men that are in the room, this is the guy you want to be. You want to be a, a man of standing. I heard a preacher say at one time like this. He said, listen, ladies, you want to hold out. Don't compromise. You need to wait for your Boaz. He said, don't compromise and go for a lazy as or a, 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 a godless as or a churchless as or a dumb as or a broke as. Wait for your bow as. I said bow as, A-Z. Thank you. We'll move on, verse 2. And Ruth the, Moabat, the Moabite said to Naomi, so she said to her mother-in-law, let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. Naomi said to her, go ahead, my daughter. So Ruth went out, entered a field, and she began to glean behind the harvesters. So, so this, 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 uh, this method of gleaning was something that God gave to his people, instructed his peop people back in the book of Leviticus chapter 19. It was a way that, that the people of God would sort of make means or take care of the poor, the, the outcasts. Uh, those who just didn't have a, is enough to, to survive. It was kind of like their food pantry of the day. And so the harvesters, when they were harvesting, what, what they were to do was when things would fall to the ground or there would be excess or leftover, they would, rather than gathering up all the little bits and pieces and the extra for themselves so that they could have more, they would allow people to come behind them and glean and take that that was left behind so that they could have some Something to eat. It was a way that God provided and instructed his people to always be looking out for, making room for, caring for the widow, the orphan, the outcast, and so on. And so, um, so this is what uh, Ruth is doing. The daughter-in-law of Naomi is, is gleaning in the harvest fields just to have food to eat. Because I don't know if you remember, but, but widows back in that day, um, and remember Ruth lost her husband too. She's a widow and Naomi, her mother-in-law, is now a widow. And widows back in that day, many of them, they had no way to provide for themselves, no way to even get food. Many of them would sell their bodies just to survive, just to get food to eat. And so we find Ruth here going and gleaning behind the harvesters just to have food to eat. Verse 3 says this, so Ruth went out to gather grain behind the harvesters, and as it happened, and I love what another translation I read said, it said, it just so happened it just so happened she found herself working in a field that belonged to Boaz, this man of standing, the relative of her father-in-law, Elimelech. Have any of you ever just found yourself in a situation, or maybe you, 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 even after something happened, you look back and you go, you know, that was a God wink. You know, that, that was... That was just God kind of winking. God, God was looking out for me. God did that. He had my back. He, he made that happen just for me. And this is kind of one of those moments that just kind of feels like God winking at Ruth. She just 
happened to come across Boaz. It just so happened that Boaz, or that this field belonged to Boaz. And the book of Ruth is not a book where we see a lot of miracles. It's not a book where we see blinded eyes open and lepers healed and dead people raised from the dead, but it's a book where we see the supernatural providence of God. What are you talking about, Pastor? The supernatural, pro- what, what is the providence of God? This is when God uses ordinary circumstances to bring about his supernatural plans in our lives. Just every day, just going about life, normal, ordinary circumstances, and God works in those ordinary things to bring about his provision and his blessings and his plan in our lives. We see providence spoken of in Romans 8, chapter 8. The Bible says, in all things, God works for the, to the good of those who, are, who, 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 who love him and who are called by his name. So next we see kind of the, it's kind of the chick flick plot twist where, where the, 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 the star of the story here, Ruth, is kind of at her lowest point. She, she, she's homeless, she's helpless, she's hurting, she's gleaning from the harvesters leftover food to eat. She's out there at her lowest point and enter the handsome hero, Boaz. So this is kind of where we're at in the story. We don't know if he's handsome, but it makes for a better movie. Um, so, um, Enter the handsome hero. This kind of reminds me of, 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 uh, of Polly, to be honest with you. Kind of reminds me of Polly. I can remember back in 1987 when she had just gone through a, a hard breakup with her, her high school boyfriend and was now at college and enter into the gymnasium on Lee University campus. The handsome, athletic, Devonair, young man. I, I, I digress. As it happened, it just so happened, Ruth came across a man named Boaz, a man of standing. It just so happened. And you may find yourself at times looking at other people's lives and, and comparing yourself to other people's lives and saying, you know, what? Well, Why did that happen for them? You know, why did she find someone that is just Mr. Wonderful? Why why did he find someone that's such a good wife and such a good mother? And why did why did they land in their dream job? And 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 why are things going for them so good? So so it just so happened sometimes is not just a just so happened moment. Many times things come because things have been bathed in prayer. Many times things come out of of a grandmother's prayer and a grandfather's prayer that have been praying for their children and their grandchildren for decades. And a mom and a dad who have been praying for their children for months and months and years and years. And so those as it happened or those just so it just so happened moments many times in our lives are not just just so happened moments. So how did this it just so happened to happen moment just so happened to happen in the life of Ruth? Well, if you remember, um, if you remember back in chapter one, Naomi prayed to God for Ruth. Naomi, her mother-in-law, prayed for Ruth, and she prayed this prayer. She said, may the Lord show you kindness. May the Lord bring you a husband, Ruth. Can I remind some of us this morning that when you pray, God listens When you pray, God hears every prayer that you pray. When you pray, God really cares. When you pray, God just so happens to show up. Many times when we weren't expecting him to show up. So pray for your future spouse. Ladies, gentlemen, who one day hope to be married. Pray for your future spouse. Listen, parents, pray for the spouse of your children. Listen, Polly have prayed some in, and we've prayed some out. We, we, we have prayed some boyfriends in, and we've prayed some boyfriends out. We've prayed some girlfriends in, and we have prayed some, some girlfriends out. Pray for God cares, and God just so happens to show up when we oftentimes aren't expecting him. The fervent prayers of a righteous man or woman availeth much, the Bible tells us. So stand on the word of God, the promises of God. So here we have 
roots. She's working, and it's just an ordinary day for her. She's just out there just, just, just doing her thing, just trying to survive, just trying to make her way as a, as a young widowed woman in her, in her society, in her community. And it just so happens she meets Boaz, who the Bible describes as a man of standing. She just happens to meet a guy that she would have dreamed to meet. She just happens to meet a guy that she would have prayed to meet a guy like Boaz. And here's what it says in verse 4. It says, while she was there, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem, and he greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you, Boaz said. The Lord bless you, the harvesters replied. And immediately we see some things right off the bat about Boaz. We see he's, this, guy, this guy appears to be a leader. He owns farms. He's a man of means. He's a man of standing, the Bible says. He's, he's positive. He's kind. But the first thing that comes out of his mouth, the first thing that is mentioned by Boaz is his God. The first thing that comes out of his mouth is the Lord. The Lord bless you. The Lord bless you. Listen, if you don't hear about God early, if you don't hear about God early, most people, when you meet someone and you're getting to know someone, what they talk about first and early says a lot about what is most important to them. So listen, young ladies, young men, if you don't hear talk about the Lord, the one that means the most to them, first and early, make a note of that. I love that Boaz is not a priest, he's not a prophet, he's not a pastor, but he has a ministry. The Lord bless you. The Lord be with you. Listen, his work is his mission field. I love the fact that he, he's not in full-time ministry, but did you know you don't have to be in full-time ministry to be in full-time ministry? The, his work is his mission field. And watch this, while serving God, Boaz just happens to notice Ruth. While just serving God in his mission field, he just happens to notice Ruth. Now, what does that mean, notice? Well, if, 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 we're, being, if we're being candid this morning, listen, her online profile was not ideal. I mean, think about it. She came from the wrong pedigree. She was a Moabite. Um, she, she, the wrong people, they, her, her people, they were conceived out of incest, literally. She's from the wrong background. She's got the wrong pedigree. She, she's from the wrong religion. She goes to the wrong, she came out of the wrong church. She came from that church that worshiped Chemosh, this demon God. Um, she's not a virgin. She's been married before. And that was a big, big, big deal back in that day. And maybe the worst of all is that she came with a mother-in-law. I mean, think about it. That would have been, for a lot of guys, that would have been, mm, I don't need that extra baggage. And they'd have swiped left or right. I don't know which way you swipe on those things, but they'd have swiped. She had a complicated past, but listen, her past did not define who she was. And if I could say this to some of you this morning, listen, don't let your past talk you out of God's plan for your future. No matter what you've been through, no matter what you've, what you've done, what, what, what it looks like, what everything behind you, don't let your past talk you out of God's plan for your future because there's more than one chapter to your story. Listen what happens in verse 5. Verse, fa verse 5, Boaz asked his foreman, who is that young woman over there? Who does she belong to? And the foreman replied, she's the young woman from Moab who came back with Naomi. She asked me this morning if she could gather grain behind the harvesters. And she has been hard at work ever since. Now I want you to just to notice some, some things that, that Boaz notices in Ruth uh, that a man of standing would have picked up on and been looking for. And this is important to note, listen, when, when, when you're looking for a spouse, those of you in the, in the room this morning that are, that are, that are single today, when, when you're looking for someone, it's important that you be the person that your dream person would want to have, Right? So I want you, I want you to notice 
um, some things that Boaz, a man of standing, would have noticed and did notice and would have picked up on, on, on Ruth in, the, in this passage. Number one, she's faithful to God. She's faithful to God. She had turned her back on the false god of Camo. She made the public statement, your people will be my people, your God will be my God. And she moved from the forbidden land of Moab back to God's country of Bethlehem, back to, back to God's town of Bethlehem that was blessed where his, he had his people at this time. So she's faithful to God. He noticed this. She was loyal to her family. She stayed with Naomi. She stayed with her mother-in-law. The other daughter-in-law chose to stay back in Moab, but Naomi said, no, where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. Your people will be my people. She was faithful to her family. This would have been important to a man of standing. She was a hard worker. The Bible, the foreman said she's been hard at work ever since she got here. Listen, she wasn't sitting at home feeling sorry for herself, feeling sorry for her circumstances. She wasn't sitting at home just waiting for somebody to come and and make a better life for her. She wasn't sitting at home blaming everybody else for all of her problems. She was out there working. Look, I heard you can get free food down here at this field. I'm going to go and ask them if I can just come behind them and take whatever I find left. I'm going to do my thing. I'm going to make a way for myself. She was a hard worker. She honored God morally. I said a minute ago, listen, most, most of the widows of that day, you know what they did to survive, to, to, to make a living, to, to pay for a home or to buy food? They sold their bodies. She refused to do this. She went out and she was working. She was honoring God morally. In verse 8, goes on and says this, Boaz went over and said to Ruth, listen, my daughter, stay right here with us. You can kind of see him starting to, starting to have some fondness for, for Ruth. Listen, my daughter, stay, stay right here with us when you gather grain. Don't go to any other fields. I've warned the young men not to treat you roughly. And when you're thirsty, you help yourself to the water that they have drawn from the well. So right away we see Boaz having this desire to kind of protect her and to care for her needs. And then in verse 12, Boaz prays for her. Listen to this. He says, may the Lord repay you for what you have done. In other words, for the way that you're living, for for living a life that honors and serves God. May the Lord repay you for what you've done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. So here's some qualities that Ruth notices in Boaz, this man of standing, this kind of a dream guy. She notices this about him. He honors her. Ladies, these are some things, some things to look for. Men, these are some things to strive for for you. He honors her. You know, he opens the door for her, goes ahead of her. He lets her go first. He protects her. He protects her from other men. He said, I've already warned the guys. They better treat you right. He guards her heart, her purity. He provides for her. You know, every now and then, man, you got to take her out to eat somewhere where you actually have to leave a tip. Every now and then, you got to do something, not every now and then, but regularly. He provides for her. He even goes above and beyond. He prays for her. And ladies, can I say this? Listen, you don't want to marry a man that you can't pray with. You don't want to marry a man that that, that, is not, that that is just not the order of the day because there's going to come a day when you're going to need the prayers of a partner joining with your prayers to pray over the, the crisis that's happening in your marriage or the crisis that's happening with your children or the crisis that's happening in your home or at work or et cetera, et cetera. Listen, listen, a spiritually lazy man is the worst kind of lazy that there is. Verse 14, at mealtime, Boaz said to her, come over here, have some bread and dip it in the wine vinegar. These were, these were like delicacies. This was like extra. When, when she sat down with the harvesters, he offered her some roasted grain, and she ate all that she wanted and had some left over. Listen, so many times I see so many people, I see it in our young people, I, I, I see it all the time, people settling, 
settling for, for less than God would have for them. We're settling for a salad when God wants us to have the, the four-course meal. When God wants us to have the, the man of standing or the woman of standing, and we, and, and we settle. She ate all this she wanted and then had some left over. This is just a, a picture of what God, God loves to do in the lives of his children. In summary this morning, I just want to say this. We're, we're a lot like Ruth. Every one of us in this room, we're a lot like Ruth. She was a Moabite. She sinned against God, and every single one of us have sinned and fallen short of God's glory, of his plan, his will. She came empty-handed to the table. The Bible says that our hearts are inherently wicked, that our righteousness is as filthy rags on our best day. Our best, our righteousness is as filthy rags compared to him. We come to the table empty-handed, and everything good that we have, we have gleaned from a a good God, a provision-making God, a supernaturally provision-making God. Boaz blessed Ruth with more than she expected, and God blesses us with so much more than we deserve with his forgiveness, his salvation, His goodness, his mercy, his love, the provision that he makes in our lives. And lastly, Boaz, he invited Ruth to his table. Boaz invited Ruth to the table, and Jesus invites every single one of us to the table. You know, he does this, and we do this. We're going to do this on Easter Sunday morning as part of our our Easter celebration and Holy Communion with with the bread and with the wine. Jesus invites us to the table, to the table where we we recognize and we celebrate and we we worship his broken body that was broken, that was beaten and hung on a cross and his blood that was shed, that was poured out for every single one of us. And he invites us to that table and says, I freely did this for you and I freely give this eternal life and salvation to you. And he invites us to the table. I don't know who this is for this morning, but if you've been stuck in chapter one, you've been stuck over here in Moab, it's time to turn the page. It's time to leave Moab and go back to Bethlehem. If you've never been to Bethlehem, it's time to go to Bethlehem for the very first time in your life. It's time to turn the page. When you turn from Moab, you find the blessings of God, the provision, the supernatural provision of God is always for us in Bethlehem. So if you're hurting and you're stuck, it's time to turn the page. Listen, if you're caught in in some type of addiction, there's some type of stronghold in your life, it's time to turn the page. If if you found yourself losing hope, it's time to turn the page. Battling depression, anxiety, whatever it may be, it's time to turn the page. Whatever you're going through, I can promise you God will hear your prayer. I can promise you God cares. And God just so happens to show up with his supernatural providence when we leave Moab and we return to Bethlehem. What what does leaving Moab mean? Talked about that a couple of weeks ago, but just as a reminder, that's a picture of us leaving our sin behind. That's a picture of us leaving our, our idols that we've accumulated in our lives. Those foreign gods I don't know what that may be to you. It may be, it may be your work. It may be your career. It may be money. It may be, it may be an addiction. It may be the bottle. It may be a substance. It may be a relationship. It, may, it could be so many different things. Leaving Moab is the decision to leave those false gods, those false idols, the sin, those things that separate us from God and returning home to Bethlehem, the place of God's blessing, the place of his provision. Bethlehem literally means the house of bread. Who is Jesus? The bread of life. 
So I want to encourage you this morning. Whatever chapter you're in, if it's a chapter that, man, you just wish this chapter would come to an end, listen, let's turn the page this morning. Let's make a decision to, 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 to leave Moab behind and move in to Bethlehem. Chapter 1 is over. Today we began chapter 2. And it just so happens, it just so happens today that you happen to be in church or maybe it just so happens today that you happen to be watching online. Or maybe you're going to watch this later in the week on the podcast. But it just so happens that you're hearing the Word of God this morning. And it just so happens that you're hearing a story of redemption. You're hearing a story of forgiveness. You're hearing a story of God's supernatural provision when we leave Moab and return to Bethlehem. So I don't know what that could mean to, to some of you in the room this morning. Maybe it means that your husband is here today and he just so happened to hear this particular message and he decides to turn a page and begin to honor you and to protect you and to serve you and to love you in a greater way than he ever has before. Maybe you're sitting here this morning and, and, and it just so happens you've heard the word of God and, and it just so happens the Holy Spirit is prompting you to abandon some idols in your life. Maybe, maybe the Spirit of God is prompting you that, you know what, it's time to, to shave off some, all the things that don't look like Jesus in my life and to pursue him with all of my heart. Maybe you're here this morning and, and, and it just so happens that your faith has been really, really low, but this morning you've heard an amazing story of how God provides for those that love him. And it's been a reminder that this is just a season. This is just a chapter. It's not the whole book in my life. And I can turn the page and God will meet me in chapter two. I'm going to ask you if you would to stand with me today. Maybe you're here this morning and you realize there's been an emptiness in your life. There's been something missing, something, something void. And it just so happened that you've heard talk of a very good God that loves you. And it just so happened that you've heard of a Savior named Jesus this morning who sacrificed his body. He was beaten and broken and he hung on a cross. He, he bled and died on a cross. And the only reason he did that was because he loved you so much. And he wanted to provide a way that you could be forgiven of your sin, the one thing that separates you and me from him. That his death on that cross would be the payment for yours and my sins. And maybe you're here this morning and it just so happens that, that today's the day that you realize, you know what, I need, to, I need that forgiveness in my life. I need the salvation of Jesus Christ. I need his love and his mercy. I need his, his grace to, to move beyond where I'm at in life into a life that's pleasing and honoring to him. And maybe you're here today and it just so happens that today's the day that you want to put your faith in that Jesus. I want to ask everybody, if you would, with heads bowed and eyes closed, I want to ask everybody here today just to pray this prayer with me this morning. And if you mean, this, if you mean these words, I want you just to say it out loud with me. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you for dying for me. I didn't deserve it, but you gave your life freely. And I'm forever grateful. I thank you for being with me in good times. I know you were there in the bad times. I thank you for leading and guiding me, for never giving up on me. I thank you for your faithfulness. I pray that you would come into my heart, that you would forgive me of my sins, and I turn from those sins. 
I turn from those idols. Today I leave Moab behind to come home to Bethlehem. Thank you for dying for me. Be my Lord and Savior. Fill me with your spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 I want to pray one more prayer over you this morning. If you just prayed that prayer, listen, that's not just something that we just tag on the, to the end of a sermon on, on a Sunday. That's life changing. That's life changing. Listen, we, we, we don't come to church on Sundays at Neighborhood Church just to stay the same. Listen, I, if, 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 that's been, if that's the case for you, listen, I, I beg of you, don't waste your time. Don't waste, don't waste mine. Listen, we don't, we don't come to his house just to stay the same. Encounters with Jesus change our lives. And every Sunday I come expecting, if there's one person that leaves this place, that hears a word from the word of God, the Bible promises that his word will not return void. That means something's going to happen. Either I'm going to deny it, and when I deny his word, something happens, trust me. When we deny him, things happen in our lives. Or when I hear his word, I can act on it, and I can enact it. I can put it in motion into my life. I can receive it. I can believe it, and I can make the changes necessary to coincide with it. But something happens when we encounter Jesus. So this morning, if you prayed that prayer and meant it in your heart, it's a big, big deal. It's the biggest deal that you've ever made to live for Jesus. So I applaud you. I applaud. If you made that decision for the first time in your life, welcome to the family. Things will never be the same for you. If you made that decision, prayed that prayer as a recommitment today, pray it every day. Renew your mind every day. Remind yourself who the Lord of your life is and live your life for him every single We don't just live our lives for him on Sunday mornings in a church service. Listen, we live our lives for him outside when we go to work. When we get there, that's our mission field. Don't forget that. We live our lives as we live next door to our neighbors in the kind of neighbor we are and how we love them. We live our lives when we go to a restaurant and we're a tight water, we leave a nice tip. Let's live our lives for Jesus. Amen. Amen. Listen, if you made a decision to live for him today, welcome to the family. Let us know. Please let us know. Let someone at the Welcome Center know. We'd love to celebrate and wrap our arms around you and help you with your with next steps and what it means to, to follow Jesus. Amen. Amen. Neighborhood Church, are you thankful you came to church today? Could we just give God, God praise today? Hey, would you do me a favor? Would you lift your voice one more time? Just, just 